I'm coming through uh, with all the activity of God, and so as I come back through this, uh, there's so much that that hit me this week in, in the little phrases and the little statements, and um, I'm almost caught up to where we're at in chapter 20, chapter 23, 24, where we left off there Monday night. Um, so by tomorrow, I should be about where we're at. But that that's been all month, so I'm coming up on 30 days just to get through those 20-some chapters of all the activity of God. I mean, it's like every eight verse, uh, God's doing something there. And again, all of that is to teach us uh, who God is. You know, the God, the God whom you seek over in the book of Malachi, chapter 2, and one of the, one of the atrocities is, uh, that I've said, shared with you before, and, and I think I even made you do it at one time, is that you take a piece of paper and front and back of a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and fill it up. Names of God, attributes of God, actions of God. And sadly, uh, for most that's been in the church for decades, they can't do that. And the reason of that is, is because they don't know the word of God and I'm still on my Ravenhill statement, they don't know the Word of God, and they don't know the God of the Word. Uh, and so that's when they're praying to God, they ask amiss, they ask contrary to God. So learning the things of God and how it works is so key to me today in, in our pursuit of being the people that God wants us to be. And, and it is that there are these seasons, dry seasons, now, we've seen, as I joked there, April showers. We've had all kinds of rain, and the ground is spongy, and the water flow is high and lifted up. But for a lot of people, they, they get deserts. They grow through dry seasons. They lose the luster for the Word of God, for the prayer time, for the church. Uh, they get disinterested. And so because it's uh, a fad, it's a gimmick, uh, it just passes away. They... No conviction to maintain or to stay true to it. Uh, and this doesn't please God. And again, knowing what pleases God is key to a Christian, to the church. God wants us to be faithful just as he is faithful. And so that means staying true to the things of God as he's given them to us in the scriptures with that. So in this Genesis chapter 12 and 13, this back to back, and although weeks ago, months ago, when we went through chapter 12, this is where we're introduced to Abraham. Um, at this point, we know that his name's Abram, but it's just easy for me to always say Abraham, but you know the context what I'm talking about. And there was also, uh, just while you're turning to X, uh, Genesis 12 and 13, where the scripture is going to come out of, over there in chapter I believe it was 17 and 18, where God came down and he visited with uh, Abraham, and he communed with him. They had dialogue, they had conversation about the covenant, and about chapter 18, where God came down and he said, shall I, tell, shall I tell my friend Abraham what I'm about to do? And Abraham goes through that, if I can find 50 righteous in Sodom, uh, down, get them down to 10. And at both passages, in Genesis 17 and 18, these are just phrases, again, that stick with me and, and, and stop me. And it says, and God went away. God went, went up from Abraham. And that phrase bothers me greatly. You know, I've had Christians say that. I don't feel God's Holy Spirit anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm numb. I don't, I don't have that experience of joy you know, where, you know, people said, I used to weep, and now I don't weep anymore. The Word of God was exciting to me, and now it's not exciting to me. Uh, I couldn't wait to get to church before. I couldn't wait to get to prayer meeting, and now I don't care whether I ever come. They lose the luster. They lose the longing for the things of God. And God goes away. And to me, that's where the church is at. And it goes back to this place of restoring Again, that love, that you know that scripture over in, in Revelation there, chapter 2 and 3, where he speaks to the seven churches, and he says, you've left your first love. You didn't lose it, you left it. In other words, you set them down. I, I put my keys right here. When I come in for driving a vehicle, the red car or, or the 
Man, I put the keys right there. You know why? So when I put my shoes on and my wallet, I grab the keys and I go out the door. I know I left them there. However, there are other bodies in this household and they take those keys and they move them. So that when I go to grab the keys and I say, where's the keys? Oh no. I go nuts, crazy, feeling like I've lost my mind because I can't find what I left there. Y'all been there, right? Must be related. It happens everywhere. Now, up to that to the spiritual, you have left your first love. And excitement. My cup run when was the last time your cup ran over with joy and gladness in the Lord? Oh yeah, it's been so long. Sadly for people to confess that. Others to say, oh, it happened this morning. I couldn't get enough of the word. I had to pull myself away from my quiet time with the, you know, your family and your God. Wherever you leave, as old Tozer used to say, wherever you left, that's where you're going to find. So in this, it is one of the issues that I want you to have, that you understand what God's doing in us for his purpose, his name's sake. And this happens in, in Genesis chapter 12 and 13 now. That Abraham, in this divine visit of God, he hears from God. God comes and visits him. And this is going to be Abraham's response, which to me is the same response uh, that we ought to have. And I'll, I'll give you several of these uh, in a moment. But I want to read in chapter 12, starting in verse 6. This is the first uh, visit from God in the midst of this. And so Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sachem, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was there in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and he said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now you know by now, because I don't even have to tell you, Right there, I will give you this land. That's one of the first things of the covenant, isn't it? God promised. And his response was, he built an altar unto the Lord. And, the, and the, he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built another altar unto the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journey going on still towards the south. And then in chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. And so Adam went up out of Egypt, or Adam, yeah. Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him unto the into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, and silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, and unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Abram calling on the name of the Lord. We're going to look at this prayer. Bless the Father, we thank you this day that as we call, and again, Lord, that your ears would be attentive to our prayers, our heart cries, Lord, and even while we sit here worshiping you, Lord, minds and hearts, Lord, may be distracted and disrupted on other things. Uh, but, Lord, again, may we be fixed, uh, Lord, on your things. Lord, again, the urgency of the hour, the fervency, Lord, that we need to be as the people of God. Help us, O oh Lord, that as we call, it is, Lord, not just simply as a grocery list. It is not just simply of selfish needs. But, Lord, again, it is your heart cry. It is your kingdom of business. Help us today, Father, that as we call upon you, that again, Lord, it is with intimacy with you and before you, Lord, day in and day out, Lord, that we are before you and you with us. And these things, Lord, to fulfill a life of faithfulness all the days of our life, Lord, that we can say with David, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. All honor, glory, and praise to you, Lord, for you're worthy. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray and I ask these things. Amen. I, when we came through this, and again, I, 
I know that you remember everything that I say, right? Everything. Uh, yeah, one amen. Come on. Uh, but you remember these moments of importance with this. Now, talk about favorite hymns. Sadly, in, me, in these hymn books, is not my favorite song. So, as a matter of fact, I got an old Baptist hymnal. You can see it on the way out there. Page 350. These are all on the altar. I don't know what it is about that invitation song. I think it's because of the sacredness of the altar. I like a place where you can bow the knees. You know, when you built that altar that you see, uh, for those of you who have been over at Fox's Hollow, that railing and the, and the spindles and all that. I, I had another one built, and it's often funny because I always find carpenters that want to do the knickknacks of woodwork. And we, in my first church, 19-year-old kid I was, at Petersburg Southern Baptist, that was one of the first things we did, was we built an altar. And they had the spindles. And I like the spindles because of the reference and the phrases in the Old Testament. It says that when the uh, Ark of the Covenant, they had the altar that was there. And it says is that when they got desperate, they would go in and they would grab hold of the horns of the altar. And I, I like that. that. Those little spindles over there at Fox's Hollow, uh, I mean, they're just, you know, two-inch spindles. And, but I, like that leg post there, I grab hold of those things when I'm praying or when they're praying and we're having our prayer time because I grab hold of the horns of the altar. And I'm not letting go. You know, again, you remember that when Jacob wrestled with the angel? We haven't got to that yet, but over in, in chapter like 30, 38, 39, uh, anybody coming through Genesis Bible reading? Nobody? Okay. You're all farther along, aren't you? But in Genesis 38, 39 there, and Jacob wrestled with an angel. Okay? And as they wrestled, they wrestled how long? All night. Through the night. All night. And he, the, the sun was coming up. Dawn was coming on across the horizon in the east. And the angel said to him, let me go. And he, and, and, Jacob said, I will not let you go till what? Till you bless me. I, and he held him in the figure four. I love that old Rick Flair's figure four. He had him in the figure four. And he said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. You could pray all you want and ask for things every day and call upon the Lord and never get nothing. Because you don't do it with a steadfastness of saying, I am not going to be denied, Lord. I'm praying for my loved one's soul. Now, again, you know when you pray that you're praying in agreement with God because God's desire is, I would have none to perish. I would have none to go away from. So you know that you're praying in agreement with God. You're calling upon God for what's on God's heart. And that, that's important. Abraham built an altar and called upon the Lord in this. Now, again, when we go through step by step, I want to walk through your five, six things in our Christian lives that brings us to call upon the name of the Lord. And so the first one is, again, you hear me quote this promise, and you, I guess repetition is good. You all memorize by repetition? Huh? You all still remember when you was uh, 15 years old? You still remember your telephone number? Because you had repetition long before we had caller ID and program it into a phone, mm -hmm. you know, social security numbers that you had to write out so many times so you memorized it, and, and repetition, you say it over and over. I can still remember our number from up at Western Port, and that was 40 years ago mm -hmm. in that. But that was because of repetition. I also memorized one of my first verses, 2 Timothy 2.15, and you all quote this one, study to show yourself approved unto God, I know that verse because Dad said it every week. I never read it. I just heard him say it. John 3, 16. Most people know that verse out of repetition because, not because they've read it, but because they've heard it repeated so many times. Now, Jeremiah 33, 3, you're going to hear, you've heard me say it almost every week, so you ought to be getting this by repetition. Call one to me. Can you finish it? And I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call upon me. This is God giving us permission. 
that we call upon him so we can get an answer for the need that's at hand. The first act of calling upon the Lord for any Christian is found over in the book of Romans. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, you know this verse? Shall be saved. Nobody is saved without calling upon the Lord. Now, what do they call? What are they calling for? I'm lost and I need to be saved. No man ever gets saved until they realize that first part. What? That they're lost. You know, it's like the guy saying, You're drowning, you're drowning. And they get ready to throw him one of the rescue tires, the life preservers, and they say, No, I'm going down for the third time, but I'm okay. Tragic this past week to see down in the uh, Outer Banks, a four-year-old drowned. And then that there were three others that were going out, and a fireman from New Jersey went out, and he pulled all three in at the same time against the riptide. You know, three saved, but one was lost, the four-year-old. How, how tragic. Awful. But again, throw out the lifeline. That's not in our hymn books either, but that's one of my favorite invitations as well. That's another one of those... 346 <laughs> hymns that you're going to have to sing at my funeral. Uh, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. And you can see them. They're drowning. They're drowning. And, and sometimes they're calling out for help, but most of the time they're not because they don't even know that they're lost. You go tell somebody, hey, look, you're lost in sin. You're dead in trespasses and sin. You're lost and on your way to hell, and you need to be saved. And they get defensive. Well, I'm not such a bad person. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I, I try to be a good good guy, good gal, and all that. And, of course, you fire back, Romans chapter 3. There is none good. No, not one. We're all in need of salvation. We, that means we all have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And, again, I come to this. Is that true of all of us that are in this, in this house today? Have you called upon the name of the Lord? You, I've never, ever assumed. Oh, well, we're all in church today. Just because people are in church does not mean that they're saved. They've never had a reference, a time that they called upon the Lord and said, this is my day of salvation. I've said this, and I, I say it to you, the same as I said it over at Fox's office. Jean's, Jean Ayers' memorial service was easy for me to preach, and people was like, that was, that was such a good service and all that. And I said, that's because we talked more about death and dying than we did living. Mm -hmm. We got, I knew Jean's testimony. She shared her testimony left and right. I knew her favorite song. She shared, this is my favorite. If I would pick that, like I ask you all, give me your favorite song. And, and to say, that's my favorite song. And to write it down in your Bible somewhere. So that when the time comes, time comes is to say, look, that person expressed that. That was their, that was when they called upon the name of the Lord. That was the invitation song. That was the song that spoke to them, meant something to them. So there isn't just flip a coin and say, well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. No, you know, this is how this was the day that I called upon the Lord, and I love to hear people's testimony. If I come across someone and I say, look, I I, I see. I see sin in your life. I see unfaithfulness in you. You don't ever come to church. You don't ever read your Bible. You don't ever talk about God. But I do hear profanity out of your mouth. I do hear you talking about vain conversations. You talk about everything under the sun but God, the most important thing. I don't think that you're a Christian. I don't think that you're saved. Boy, who are you to judge me? It's like I'm just going by the truth that I hear and that I see in your life. So I am a Christian. Oh, okay. Well, tell me. How do you get saved? Well, well. And they don't have an answer. They don't know how they got saved. It all goes back to that. And they called upon the name of the Lord. If I was to ask some of you stand right now and tell me how you said, you'd say, I, was going, I went into my bedroom on, on May the 18th in 1984. And I fell in my face before God because I was convicted in my heart. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was going to hell. And I had to get saved. And I called upon the name of the Lord. Nobody else was in the house. Nobody else was around, but that was the day I got saved. 
It was in May 1976 that I called upon the name of the Lord. Seven-year-old snot-nosed kid. Heard the gospel. Convicted. Scared to death. I was going to die and go to hell. And I deserved it. I knew it. I knew I was a sinner. I didn't understand all these things that I talk about now and, and, and death and those kind of things. Well, how could I at seven years old? But I knew this much I knew I was lost. And I went forward. And I remember Dad saying, what would you come up here for? Scared to death. I was going to get in trouble. And I did get in trouble. But I knew that that was my salvation. I called upon the name of the Lord and said, save me. When you read those things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Jesus come passing by, blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. And what did Jesus do? He stopped him and had mercy on him, didn't he? And blind Bartimaeus, amazing grace, how sweet the sound to save the wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see. Blind Bartimaeus got up that morning blind as a bat. But when he went to bed that night, he could see. Now that's physical. But for every Christian that calls upon the name of the Lord, their eyes are open and they see. They are dead in trespasses and sin, and they call upon the Lord, and he takes all their sin, and he casts them as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers them no more. Micah chapter 7, verse 19 and I take all of your sins and I dump them in the depths of the sea, no more to remember them. Because you called upon the name of the Lord. Did you have that day? Is that a special day? You know, I got my calendar here and I I circle it and I write how many hours I worked and I write how many kids got a track meet and I I don't need to write birthdays and anniversaries, most of that stuff I kind of remember. You know. And if not, I always get the hints. And they don't forget. They remember, you know, but in, in those days on the calendars, I don't need I don't need to look back on this and wonder what happened. I know the day. I remember the day. I remember what happened. I called upon the name of the Lord and I was saved. And at that moment my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So when that book is open, I know. I'm not gonna have to say, I'm not gonna have to sing that old horrible song. Now, I mean, it's a good song. I like it, but I mean, the message of it's horrible. Please search the book again. I thought my name was there. I went to church on Sunday. I bowed my head in prayer. Please search the book again. Y'all know that song? I'm not saying it. I'm just telling you what the verse is on. Because you called upon the Lord, salvation came. The second thing that we call upon is, is again, Luke 11, 13, which I've stressed to you in the prayer notebook time and time again, one of the most essential needs for us, that after we call upon the name of the Lord in salvation, you receive John 1, 12, to as many as would receive Jesus Christ, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. You receive Christ. You call upon him. He comes into your heart. He sets up camp. You are no longer your own. You are now a Christian, a son, daughter of God. And the second most important thing that we have stressed, when we went through the book of Acts, I, I, I gave this to you. When we went through the prayer notebook, I gave this to you. Is Luke eleven thirteen? Now, if you, being evil, man, I know what it is to be evil. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, give my Phil, little Philip here a good gift, a pat on the back, job well done. Shave those whiskers off. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? No, don't you love that little phrase? How much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask for it? And I've given you that question. How many of you have asked, called upon the Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit? I've had Pentecostals. I've had Charismatics. I've had Assemblies right on down the line. Can I pray for you that you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Sure. I bowed over in Hong Kong at the Children of the Faithful with the old Wendy, the 80-year-old woman that opened up that uh, orphanage there. She says, what can I pray for you? I said that I would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Henry Black, revival, experiencing God. What damn what do you want me to pray? T.W., what do you want me to pray for? Every time I've asked him, lay hands on me and call upon the Lord so that I can receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
It is the most essential thing for any Christian to walk. You want to know why Christians stumble and fall? You want to know why Christians, they, they hit and mash? You want to know why, you know, again, if I jump in a vehicle, and again, this is long before the new, newer vehicles that you all are driving and that kind of stuff. But you remember the old days if you was pulling up a hill, especially going up 46 lands towards here, going up there, and boom, 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 boom as you're going up the face. This thing is missed. A spark, one of my spark plugs must be bad. Well, that's all right. It's, it's a, it's a six-cylinder, but I only need five really working. Well, I'm down to four working. Now I'm down to three working, and now you're just barely making it with two. Pump, 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 pump. The mix. And I know Christians that are spiritually missing because they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. All of our work in the church falls back on. Why do you lose heart? Why you grow weary? Why you get discouraged? Why you become depressed? Why you fearful? Because we've not filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and have any of those adjectives. But being filled with the Spirit takes care of all that. When those, those things come, you overcome them because you know the Word of God. The Holy Spirit won't let you get fearful. I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Someone says, well, I'm crazy. Well, you can't be a Christian and crazy because you've got a sound mind. Don't you love that verse? Y'all don't know that verse, do you? I like that verse. Well, I feel so alone. Well, you're not alone because why? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Abide with me and I'll abide with you. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? Well, I'm, I'm fearful about tomorrow. Be careful for nothing but in all things with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. I know what's coming. And in all ways, God hears when God's people call upon him. He answers. And shows us great and marvelous things which we know not. Call upon him for salvation. You call upon him for the filling of the Holy Spirit. And how many other things do you call upon the Lord for in his sin? Lord, I'm calling out to you because I see my sin. I recognize my failures and my faults. It's not this generalization. Forgive me for all my sins. And God fires back. Which sins? My, <coughs> when, we, when the kids were little, and we used to do the, the Bible uh, prayer time at bed, bedtime, then again, now lay me down to sleep, pray Lord my soul to keep. We say that. God bless Mommy, Daddy, right down the line. Hannah, Joshua, Elizabeth was right down through. And they would fire through that. So then we started adding the things that I was learning in the prayer notebook. And we would go around. Everybody would have to say a worship attribute or name. Now, I think Philip monopolized King of Kings, Lord of Lords. They all fought for that. Because that was the easy one for them to remember. You are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That was said every night. Alpha and Omega. That was, yeah, every time you can say, you can't say that no more. Come up with a new one. Learn different ones. And again, if there's 105 names of Jesus in the Bible, and I've got I got 70 of them so far, and my, this last time coming through Bible readings, I was writing them all down in scripture references, and I did learn a lot of those that I hadn't had before. We made them all, we did three rounds. And all the rounds, they would have to say, God, you are love. God, you are holy. God, you are faithful. Or give a name. And so they learned the attributes and the characteristics and the names of God. Well, then we would go to confession. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for what? And now we had to confess. I, kids don't have a long list. Well, you know, I... I murdered someone today. Please forgive me. Well, I, you know, our sins that we know in adulthood are not the same as that they are for kids. So they pretty much, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't read my Bible like I should. I'm not praying like I should. I didn't obey mommy and daddy like I should. Good confession. For us as Christians to go through and to specifically know the sin wherein our offense is to God, we call upon him, forgive me for my sin. Forgive our nation for its sin. That's the reason when I look at that, 
pray for national sins. You pray for church sins. You pray for family sins. You pray for personal sins. And you know those sins that are provoking and angering the Lord, and you call upon him, because if you call upon him confessing those, whosoever shall call upon me shall be saved, Whosoever asks for the filling of the Holy Spirit shall be filled, and whosoever shall confess their sin, it shall be forgiven them. And every Christian says, Amen. My sins have been forgiven because I called upon the Lord like I'm supposed to. Now, you're going to have people come up to you throughout the week, and this is your fourth calling upon the Lord with me request. We're facing a test. We got bad news at the doctor. Hey, this happened this past week. Hey, this is the need that's on my plate, and I need to call from the Lord. Now, again, the practice of every Christian is, is that, again, I cannot remember every request that's sent and given to me. I used to in my younger days when my mind was at its best, but as you older ones have warned me and self-fulfilling prophecy, Hey, as you get older, you ain't going to be able to remember. Well, it's like a kick you in the shin because now I can't remember. So I had to buy a book. So then when I get an email, I get a text, I get a call, I write it down. And so then when I come before the Lord, I open that book up and I said, oh yes, I forgot about that. we got 12 speakers that are going to be speaking in October. And every morning, driving to work, that's my time I pray for that. I go down through the 12. Now, I got two of those guys that I've never met, don't know them, never heard of them. I, they're the hardest ones for me to remember. All the other ones I've worked with, all the other ones I've had some kind of uh, interaction. Matter of fact, three of three, a quarter of them this past week of the 12 I've called and prayed with or talked to. Just to say, hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm calling upon the Lord for you. Now, that's intercession. When you stand before God on behalf of other people, and there is nothing greater that you can do. Last week at Fox's Hollow, we had a, he was there at the funeral, and then he came to church service last week. He was one of the first ones that ever went in my prayer in this book, way, way back 12, 14 years ago. I can remember driving up into his driveway and him saying, no one cares for me. No, no one no one, no one's worried about me. And I had, at that particular time, I had my prayer notebook in the, in the car. I used to carry, carry it with me wherever I went. I said, just give me a second. Went over to the car, got my prayer notebook, the big three ring thing is upstairs. I've had multiple of those, and like everything I wear out, you know, Bibles and prayer notebooks. And so I opened right to him, Lost Souls, title Lost Souls, 100, 113 names I have in there. And I, and I put in there the day that I started praying for him. And I write in there every time that I've had the opportunity to share the gospel with him. And so I opened it there and I showed him his name. And I said, no one cares for you. I've been praying for you for four years. And standing there in his driveway, tears well in his eyes, I never knew. Well, there are so many people that are on this face of this earth that will never know that I'm calling out to the Lord for them. You have people that are on your heart, on your mind, on your shoulders that you bear their weight, and you're calling upon the Lord for them because my fear, they're not calling upon the Lord for themselves. And if you don't intercede for them, who is? Pray for them. The last Pray for each other. Call upon the Lord for your Christian brothers and sisters. Now again, that's wide range. Hand me that map behind me. Just because I saw it there. My handy dandy map. You know how I love maps. So, <clears throat> South, South America. I've never stepped foot on this continent. One of my desires was I always wanted to go to all the, all the continents except for Antarctica. I don't want to go there. Neither do you all as much as you hate the cold. But to go there to evangelize, call upon the Lord for a contact. I may never in all my lifetime step foot there, 
but I am calling upon the Lord for my brothers and sisters that are there. And I do know people that are there. I have people on Facebook that are serving in, in Peru. I have brothers and sisters that are in Bolivia. David Platt just went through the Amazon to the, some of the tribal people that have never heard the gospel. Here we are in 2018, and they've never heard about Jesus Christ. In this past year, he went there on a boat with other missionaries, and they gave the gospel for the first time to some of those tribal people. Again, fulfilling the Great Commission. Calling upon the Lord for them. When I think about what I've heard this past week in China and all the persecution that's cracking down on them, my, I call upon the Lord for them. I'll never meet them face to face. That was one of my tragedies when I did go to Hong Kong. I really wanted to meet someone that was in the underground church. But again, I can't go there, so I'll just pray for them. I'll call upon the Lord for them. And that when we go through, when I go through and I pray for Kaiser Church, or I pray for Foster Paula Church, and I have you listed there, and I write out from that, this happened in their life, that happened in their life, and call upon the Lord for God to do in you what God wants us to do. To make us to be a, a healthy body, a right body, a pleasing body to God. And those are the things. Call for salvation. Call for filling of the Holy Spirit. Call out for other people. Call out for the conviction and confession of sin. Call out for one another. Call upon the Lord. And it is, is that he built an altar and he bowed the knees. I know, y'all, I can't bow my knees. I don't get down like I used to. And I get down and I can't get back up. And I know on a hardwood floor, that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing to do. To go in there where the carpet is and get down there and, and, and all that. But you go to these places in other countries, and you say, let's pray, and they get prostrate down on the floor, mm -hmm. weeping, sobbing, crying out, travailing, calling upon the Lord because they're desperate. There are men, there's, there's issues. You talked about praying for the drugs and that. Man, I mean, is there any greater fear than to know with all the headlines and all the ODs is to say, who's next? This week, this night. You know how many times I've grabbed hold of the horns of the altar over there at Foster Paul? In Saturday night prayer meeting, and said, not this night, Lord. You're not going to let Satan take, take that drug out of this night. I read there a murder-suicide. I read where a wife, uh, a husband got ready the other morning down there near Frederick, Maryland. Sent his kids to school. Went in, killed his wife. Went down the road to a hotel and took his own life. I read those headlines, and I've read them for, for four years, murder, suicide. And I rise up and I call upon the Lord saying, not today. No murder, suicides today. No school shootings today. I, I told you this, and I tell you again. Trina over there at Fox's Hall, she took responsibility. 2 p.m., from 2 o'clock to 3 p.m., her and Jean split that, that hour. And I'll never forget the day she came in there crying into the church service. And I said, what's going on? And she was like, well, you read about the school shooting. And I was like, yeah. And she said, did you know when that happened? And I told her the day. I knew the day that it happened. And she said it happened at 2.13. She said, I didn't pray that day. She's like, that's on my watch. I did not call upon the Lord. No school shootings today. She, she's very diligent to always mention that in her prayers because of that incident. I remember that morning that he rebuked. <coughs> we didn't pray this morning, and a school shooting happened that day, and he blamed me. Well, I turned around blaming him. Well, you didn't pray either. Well, you can look, cast the blame all you want, but it all falls back on this one truth. Call upon the Lord. It's a two-way street. The old hymn book, Jesus is tenderly calling, calling today, calling me home. Jesus is tenderly calling. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. Come home. Jesus beckons, come home. Come home. Call upon me, be thou saved.
Call upon me to be thy fill. Call upon me. Confess your sin. Call upon me. Pray for the needs at hand. Call. If you call, Jeremiah 33, 4, call. I'll hear you. You know what I mean? So, we're going to sing that song. Upon <coughs> Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You know anybody on sinking sand today? They're sinking. And they're reaching out, crying out, Help! Help! Who's going to help? Psychologist? Humanist? No. Oh. But Jesus. Jesus comes tenderly calling to death. Come on. Come on. Well, while we're singing, I'm going to close the prayer.